start it out saying like intensity and emissivity or wavelength to the fifth, A over E to the B over lambda T plus one. And then you look at that and you go, crap, I don't need that, I need this. So then you have to solve it. But fortunately, you've done the algebra, so you can just look up that equation and use it again, okay? So that one should be in the bag. Hopefully, you all got that with no problems, okay? Anybody need me to do it? No? Okay. Next, we say the same emissivity can be used across the entire spectrum. How much energy is being radiated? So there's two key words there. How much energy is being radiated and across the spectrum? So which equation are we going to be using for that one? Yeah. Now you had this drifting in there. How many of you figured out that you have to stick that emissivity in front of it? Good, if you figured that out, that's good. I didn't put it in the PowerPoint because I hadn't talked about emissivity by the time I didn't use that equation. That's probably a bad idea. But you do need emissivity in there. There is a problem with this in that emissivity generally does change with wavelength. So you'd have, have to do an integration over wavelength would be a little bit different. But since I said you can use it across the entire spectrum, you can use one in the city. Okay? And then the last one is what wavelength would peak emission occur? And here the keyword is peak. So we know we have that lambda T max or yeah. And the T max is equal to some constant, you know, I'm just going to write the K there, 29, 89, whatever stuff like that. Okay? So all of those should be fairly painless. Okay? But we have 199.33, but this is 200. 199.33. 1.99. 1.99. 1.99. Yeah, that's your channel. Huh? That's really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This one? We got 199, yeah. This is close enough to two. Yeah, okay. it's like that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's got a little bit of rounding going on here. Um, now, I, I should say, even though we have rounding going on for these, when you use that equation with the exponential, you have to be careful about not rounding <coughs> at the end because our exponentials are very sensitive to you know, rounding. Yes? Yeah, sir. So I intended to the 200 yeah. Okay. That's probably because you didn't use the emissivity of 0.9. So it wasn't one. Yeah. Yes. You had? I said if the same emissivity of 0.9 can be used across the entire spectrum. Now, as I said, in your PowerPoint, you don't have any emissivity written in there, but they actually need to be in there, assuming you can use it across the way. Okay? Problem there? Okay. So, in that case, we're going to move on. Satellite retrieval. So, everything I've been talking to you leads up to this point. So we've been doing a bunch of theory here. But before we even start putting the theory into algorithms, let's talk about satellites themselves. Let's talk about these instruments. And these things have a couple of basic orbits that are used. You can do more orbits, but there's two main ones that are being used all the time. One is a low polar orbit, where you have the satellite goes around, and of course, as the satellite is going around, what's the Earth doing? Rotating beneath it, okay? What this means is that every time you come around, you're gonna be seeing a different part of the Earth, which is both good and bad. It's good because you get to see a different part of the Earth every time you come around. 
It's bad because if you're trying to watch what's happening in real time, you have to wait until it comes around again. Now, how long do you think it takes for one orbit? Oh, you probably have it written down there. But without looking at your PowerPoints, if you pick them up. Without looking at your PowerPoint, how long do you think it would take for the satellite to go around the Earth once? A day. 365 days, 24, 24 hours. 24 hours. hours. Uh, uh, remember, it isn't going around like hours. this. It does two in a day, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, he looked at his PowerPoint. Okay, it turns out that if you're in low Earth orbit here, yes, it's going to take you, we'll get there. Yeah, come on. Get there. We'll come back to that. Oh. Yeah, but yeah, it takes about 90 minutes. Okay? We'll look at that later. But there's something happening. We see that these swaths don't overlap. But there's a reason for that. Like, David, how much of the Earth can you see right now? About half of it. Okay. How much can you see right now? <laughs> Not as much. Okay. Because the satellite is down pretty close. We want to be close so we can get a good look. But what you give up is you're not seeing the whole Earth. So when we're going around like that, we're kind of missing parts of the Earth. This, of course, is a little bit of a problem. Now, if we were going around, instead of going around the pole, if we are going around the equator, you know, we'd be going around like that. Every swath would overlap perfectly, which would be great, except that then you missed most of the Earth. So there is a compromise where we go a little off the pole, and if we go a little off, then you begin to get better over them. So most of these satellite orbits, they don't go straight over the poles, they kind of go over off the poles a little bit. And what that means is the satellite orbit, it would look kind of like this. It doesn't go to the North Pole, it doesn't go quite to the South Pole, it kind of has a swath like that. But the next one, they have a better chance of overlapping, so you can cover the whole Earth. Now, they still don't do perfect overlaps in many cases, we're going to see why in a moment. But, if we're going to calculate this, you've well done physics supposedly, you know, gravitational acceleration has to equal the centripetal, so you can go ahead and you can do your calculation, get your speed, get your time from that, and you end up with about 90 minutes. Turned out if you're right at the Earth's surface, it's 84 minutes. And of course, what happens to the timing as you get further away? It's more. They get more, okay? So it's going to be increasing. So that's the near polar orbit. There is a problem with the near polar orbit. Um, but first of all, it could be a high resolution, but episodic, because you may think, oh, I just have to wait 90 minutes, I'm going to see the same thing again, but you don't. Because it's moving, you have to wait typically a whole day before you're going to see the same point over again on the surface. So, there's another thing that's going, that's a little wrong with near polar orbit. Normally, if you have an orbital plane like this, okay? And somebody in the middle is the sun, and it's going to make like Nicole the sun or something. Like when orbiting around this, you think that the, the axis of rotation, the plane of rotation, would stay the same, like that. So right now, the sun would be around noon and passing over the equator, okay? But now, if you're using Nicole again as the sun, which part? What time of day are you looking at the Earth right now? That would be noon time. Where's the satellite? Satellite's not passing over a noon time. Satellite's passing over a twilight. So if we're doing a three, if we're going around the year, then the satellite would be passing over the Earth at different times of day during the year, which isn't good if you're trying to watch the same thing happening. However, we get lucky. We get lucky because the Earth is not a perfect sphere. As you know, it's a little bit egg-shaped. And for complicated reasons, that means that this orbit doesn't stay the same thing. It kind of precesses. And if you can get everything lined up right, 
you can get it so that an overpass is near noon time, on one part of the year, and as it goes around, the plane of, of orbit changes, and you're still overpassing around noon time. Okay. Mathematics of that, we're not going to get into. And to be honest, you know, I, I couldn't walk you through all the mathematics of processing there unless I was just giving the numbers. But it can be done. But if you're trying to get the same overpass, of course, you're, you're locked into limits of what you can do. So normally what happens with this is people like to set things into um, what's called the sun synchronous orbit. So that it's usually like 100 minutes long, a little bit further away from the Earth. And then it's going to be wherever I am, still overpassing the same relative to the sun. But the trade-off you get is it turns out the swaths don't perfectly overlap anymore. And you will see in some of the satellite data, you can see these gaps in the data. And that's because they can't get everything to work out perfectly. They're doing the best they can. You're still going to be missing a little bit of data at every overpass. And then normally it takes like a couple of weeks before you cover them. Okay? Oops, not like So yeah, if you're ever wondering how a sun synchronous orbit comes about, if the if the Earth is not perfect. Okay, but a problem with polar orbit is you're going to wait at least 90 minutes, probably a whole day before you see the same thing again. If you're trying to track a storm, that's not going to cut. Yeah, you know, storms are already come and gone in a whole day, or as it travels across you know, a third of the country or something like that. So what you want to do is you want to be able to watch a moving target because this thing is orbiting around. So how are we gonna arrange it so that the satellite can stay over the same point even though the Earth is rotating? Does that the same speed of the Earth? Same speed of the Earth. And how long does it take for the Earth to rotate? 24 hours. So if close to the Earth is 90 minutes, where do you think 24 hours has to be? And it's actually doing more of it. It has to be pretty far away in its five Earth ratio. Okay? So you get to watch things constantly. You get to make a movie, but you're making a movie from really far away, which means you're losing resolution. So that's the trade-off. I want to watch things high resolution in time, I get lower resolution in space. Well, high resolution in space, I'm ending up with lower resolution in time because, you know, Earth's rotating and stuff like that, okay? So those are the trade-offs. Another trade-off that you get is, this is much further away, it can't pick up really weak signals. So that's actually why it has to have coarse resolution because you need bigger areas to look at. So the weakest signal that we were talking about, we didn't talk about too much yesterday, is a micro. We don't get microwave and geosynchronous orbit. We can get visible, you can get near IR, we can get you know the thermal infrared and some of the water vapor channels. But some of these other ones way out there, like microwave, we're not gonna get those. Okay. So yeah, the continuous but low resolution. Um, typically the highest resolution that we're getting right now from the geosynchronous is in the visible, it has to be the, the highest energy wavelength, 250 meters. And then with the thermal infrared, we're getting about one kilometer. With the polar orbiting, that's like Landsat, we can get down to like 10 meters and, you know, 90 meters or 30 meters for the, um, for the thermal infrared, stuff like that. So you get a big change in resolution. Now, the scan patterns that we're usually using, These are really good sensors. So you may think, oh, let's put a bunch of sensors like a camera, I can just take pictures like a camera as we go along. Well, that would cost too much money. Plus, the Earth is moving underneath us. So what we do instead is we just make one <coughs> row of scanners, one row of, you know, LLDs there. No, um, CCDs. One row of CCDs there. And 
it just sweeps across the earth and you make your picture line by line as it sweeps across the earth. Okay? That's one way of doing it. Another thing that you can do is you can turn it sideways. Like if you're in a geosynchronous orbit, the earth is not rotating underneath you. So you can't just have one line, just sit there and give you one line. So what they do is they sweep across with that line of sensors. That's usually called like a push-through scan. Okay? And there's other scan patterns. But if you're looking at data and you see like lines and streaks in the data, you have to go back and look at the scan pattern to figure out why do I have these lines and what sensors are messing up on them. Okay. So what's happening is you have this line of detectors here. They're going to get the highest resolution at the center when you're looking straight down. As you go further out, it's going to become distorted. It's become a bit bigger and stuff like that. So when you're getting the raw data from the satellite, oh great, I can make an image. If we're looking at the whole image, you're going to find out it starts to look funny as you go near the edges. Okay? Now, Landsat tries to compensate for that. They don't use a wide swath pattern. They use a much narrower swath. And then it's not, you don't have as much distortion going on. But, the flip side of that is it takes about two weeks before you see the whole earth and land sand. You can have a smaller swath. Okay? So just to get an idea, I know you can't see all of this, but these different satellites like Landsat will have a bunch of different um, wavelength bands. Like Landsat will have blue, green, and red, so you can make RGB images. As a near infrared, we're going to find out that's used for looking at vegetation. And then you may have like a water vapor infrared, and you're going to have the thermal window infrared, stuff like that. And all of these will have resolution. So the geosynchronous satellite, up until about a year ago, we only had six different bands in the geosynchronous. So we'd have, we wouldn't have RGB, we'd really just have one kind of broad visible one, you know, a few of those. Then we'd have our thermal infrared. We'd have a few different thermal infrareds. And the reason you wanted those is you want at least one of those to be sensitive to water so that you can detect kind of how much water there is there and you can correct for it. But the reason you don't have as many channels for this is much further away, much more expensive detector. So they're kind of saving money. Now recently, the geosynchronous has become almost as good as this one. This is the MODIS that went up about 15 years ago. This was the one that went up when I started my graduate school career. 32 different wavelengths. So they're picking out all of these different things for detecting clouds and aerosols and ocean color. All of these, they will kind of give you explanations for what they can do. Okay. The new geosynchronous is kind of halfway between the old one and the modus. The new geosynchronous can now have 16 different channels. We can do a lot of stuff with it, all in real time, like watching a movie. So it's kind of cool. So I'm not going to go through this in a whole lot of detail, but there's a lot of satellites up there. This is just a short list of the most common ones. Like Landsat is the highest resolution, because that's for looking at crops and stuff like that. If you're doing any climate work, something that AVHRR, and by the way, most of these acronyms are stupid. Like that advanced very high resolution radiometer from 1970 has the same resolution as the moderate resolution radiometer from 2000. They're stupid. Okay, so. A lot of papers request that, oh yeah, spell out the whole acronym. Well, they don't really mean anything, so screw it. <laughs> so people say MODIS is AVHRR, and you know what they are. MODIS has a bunch of channels, about one kilometer resolution. CloudSat, this one makes sense. It's a cloud satellite. Thank you for giving me a reasonable name. <laughs> Okay, polar orbiter, um, it has LIDAR for looking at clouds. TRIM, tropical rainfall measurement system. Yes, that one makes sense. But that also has a LIDAR, a microwave, 
By the way, this one is looking at clouds with a LiDAR. This one is looking at rainfall with a LiDAR. How do you think the wavelengths of the LiDAR might compare? Which one would have the longer wavelength? The ones for looking at clouds or the one for looking at rain? Rain. Rain. Raindrops are bigger. You want a longer wavelength, and then maybe you can ignore all the clouds and only see the rain. Okay? So this one, if you had a longer wavelength for the cloud, you may not even see the cloud, you'd only see the rain. So yeah, you change the wavelengths depending on what you're doing. We have a couple of microwave uh, satellites up here, polar orbiting, they can only be polar orbiting. Soundings is not something that I've talked about, and I won't, it's really getting a vertical slice in the atmosphere, kind of mathematically complex, you need a whole bunch of wavelengths to do that. A fairly new one. SMAP, soil moisture, um, something, uh-oh, I forgot exactly what the A and the P stand for. But the SMAP is soil moisture measurement project here. So it's using microwaves. Microwaves, like a microwave oven, is sensitive to moisture, rotational bands. We're going to be talking about that one. Go is geosynchronous, okay. So geosynchronous orbiting environmental satellite, that's a name that actually makes sense. It turns out NASA is often the stupid one when it comes to names, and NOAA has better names, more sensible names. Okay, and we have a new goes up, so it used to be like one to eight kilometer resolution, now it's more like MODIS, so it's about twice as good resolution. Now, other we have our own geosynchronous satellite looking on the east and the west side of the United States. Other countries each have their own geosynchronous satellite because guess what? It's looking at their country. We don't bother to spend money to look at India or China. We look our own. Now, there is a big difference between these. Um, other than the fact that the Europeans and Japanese actually had a good geosynchronous satellite up before we did, the other difference is we're a big, wealthy country. All our satellite data is free. If we're trying to get satellite data to look at you know, geosynchronous India or China or stuff, they want money. Okay? Or you have to have some special arrangement with them. You have to know somebody, work it out, and stuff like that. There are a lot of people in Europe, China, and India who use American satellite data because it's free. And they, they have to either pay or be part of a project to get it for free themselves. So we are a gift to the world here, our own satellites. Okay, one thing which I hadn't talked be about before, but I'm putting it here. Most of the time when you use satellite data and you're looking at solar data, you're going to be looking at not the intensity, but the reflecting. And the reflecting is the total upward scattered energy divided by initial energy of the sun. And then there's this cosine theta in there. Why do you think that cosine theta is in there? Not optical depth. Well, tell you what. Oh, well, let me take a piece of paper. <coughs> right now, underneath the light, I'm collecting lots of light. How much light am I collecting now? None. So what has to do, and we know this, the sun goes down, you get colder. The light is being spread out over this horizontal surface. So it has to correct for the amount of light that's actually hitting the surface, and then you have the amount that's being scattered up. Now, in order to get that, of course, they can't measure over all the angles. So they take one angle that they're looking at, and they assume that it's going to be um, symmetrical. Is that true? Does a mirror reflect light in all directions symmetrically? No. Point, point, right? It comes in and goes like that. There will be times where the reflectance will go above one, saying that by their calculation, more energy is being reflected than came in. But that's because you're looking at a case where maybe you're getting you know, direct mirror-like reflection code. But reflecting typically would go between zero and one. And it's a great thing to use because 
if we're just looking at intensity, that's going to change with where the sun is. They've already corrected for where the sun is. So we're looking at the intrinsic reflectings of the surface. So if you have a, if you have reflectings in your data, use the reflectings. If they give you intensity, then you may have to do this yourself. Okay. But nearly every satellite data set they calculate the reflectings for you. Okay. Everybody understand why this goes between zero and one theoretically? You can't reflect more light than comes in unless if not symmetrical, then you're making the wrong thing. So, reflecting theoretically adjusts for sun angle, but intrinsically the surface, not the time of day, should go between zero and one, but scattered not only uniform, you may be looking at hot spot there where more is being scattered in one direction. So, sometimes it go, can go larger than one. And um, the reflecting that they give you is probably not correct for the atmosphere. There's somebody shouting optical depth there. Well, usually that's going to be your job unless they tell you they've done atmospheric correction. So you know what? We're going to have to talk about that. But before we do that, let's give you a little chance to calculate here. We have intensity of sunlight once it passes through the atmosphere. It's about 1,200 watts per meter squared. And because the sun of 30 degrees, 200 watts per meter squared of being Reflected. What is the reflectance? So, go ahead and work that out. I think we can erase this. But 
this is something you need to do with most satellite data before you do a lot of calculations. So the first thing that we need to do is talk about how you do an atmospheric correction. Typically, you're going to use our radiation transfer code to do it, but we want to understand the mechanisms that are going on beneath it. And by the way, just based on what you know, which wavelength do you think is going to be influenced the most by the atmosphere? The blue, the red, green? Blue. Blue has more of the Rayleigh scattering. Most atmospheric correction just does Rayleigh scattering. And then if you have a really good one, you put an aerosol optical depth and you can correct for that too. So let's first talk about this a little bit. So one thing that's happening is the beam is being decreased by extinction. You know, scattering in a lot of wavelengths, there could be absorption in other wavelengths. But it's going to be just a Beer's Law type thing, right? You know how to do that. So you think, oh good, we can do atmospheric correction. We're done, we're not done. Because if this light is being scattered from there, how about what if this light is hitting the atmosphere? It can also be scattered in the direction of the satellite. This is something called path radiance. So um, we're going to have de decrease by extinction, but increase due to this so-called path radiance of sun, the atmosphere reflecting light from the sun directly into the satellite. Okay? So those are the two things we have to deal with. So if you look at this, what the satellite sees, if um, IR is going to be the light reflected from the surface, and then we can multiply that by the transmittance, which we know we get from Beer's law, right? So this is this e to the minus tau, that's the uh, transmitting. And then we have to add path radiance to that to get what the satellite sees. We want to know not what the satellite sees, we want to know what is really being reflected from the surface. So we just saw that algebraically, we get the reflectance from the surface, it's going to be when seen by the satellite minus the path radiance divided by the transmittance. Okay, so this is the Rayleigh scattering correction here. We know how to calculate transmittings. We know it's going to be Rayleigh optical depth plus aerosol optical depth plus if we're in an absorption band, the optical depth from absorption. Okay. Now, in most cases, if you're trying to look at the surface, you're trying to avoid absorption by the atmosphere. You pick a wavelength that's going to avoid absorption from the atmosphere. When you come to aerosols, maybe you know what the aerosols are, maybe you don't. Most, um, a lot of atmospheric correction with this, throw up your hand and say, we don't know this. Some of them, they'll try putting an aerosol correction for you. But we're not going to worry about that. We're only going to worry about the Rayleigh scatter. Now, by the way, one neat thing about this Rayleigh scattering, it depends, of course, on how much atmosphere you're going through. Typical pressure at the surface is about 1,000 millibars. As you go up a mountain, what happens to the pressure? Increases, decreases, decreases. decreases. If, you go up to, if you go up the mountain, it may drop from 1,000 millibars to about 900 millibars. How much atmosphere do you have above you there? 90% of the original. So what you can do is if you go to a lower pressure, you take the optical depth of the atmosphere, you just decrease it by the amount of pressure. So going from 1,000 millibars to 90, you just multiply that by 0.9, you can correct for however high you are in elevation. Okay? Or even high and low pressure systems from the weather, you can do corrections for that. So, um, here's the good news. If we can figure this out on one wavelength, we can figure that out at every wavelength so long as they're doing Rayleigh scanner. We know how to do that. Okay? By the way, why don't we turn the lights on? Because the only reason is 
I know when I'm in a class and let her out, I fall asleep. Okay, so we know how to deal with the extinction using Beer's Law and Rayleigh scattering for the optic adapter. Now we have to figure out path rating. <coughs> so we have this, this light coming in here, and it's being scattered into the beam. And this one thing that we're going to ignore right now is this is secondary scattering. So we have light coming up here, and it gets scattered out, and it gets scattered back towards the satellite. We're going to ignore that just because it's going to get too complicated. But good uh, atmospheric correction would take into account the light that's coming up here is getting scattered again, other secondary scattering. It, it's kind of a small correction. So we're going to ignore the multiple scattering. So the thing is, how much light is being scattered towards the satellite? We have the sunlight coming down, it's going to hit. Remember what this shape is? That the Rayleigh scattering, the phase function, where you have the circle plus the two, the figure eight, you end up with something like this. So you're going to use the Rayleigh phase function to figure out what percentage of the light is being scattered in that direction, what percentage of the total scatter. Now the nice thing is, this sunlight, you know, you think it's coming at different angles, but we're so far away, it's only coming at the same angle. So we only have to out that direction once. Okay? So, here we go. The scattered light, of course, is going to go as a single scattering of the needle. How much is being scattered? The incoming fraction of light is going to be reduced by, you know, how far it's coming in times the phase function times the optical thickness that we're going. And we know what the Rayleigh phase function is, so we can just stick that there. Okay, so we have that. And um, for pure scattering, we know if we have the optical depth of one wavelength, we can figure it out any of the other wavelengths. So this is actually a formula for the path ratings. This is the light being scattered towards the satellite from the atmosphere, which we want to get rid of. Okay? So, if we're going to put everything in together here, we can start writing that. This is the path scattering. Then we have the extinction. Oh, that's missing. That's supposed to be for the extinction. Yeah, that's the furthest thing. And then we can change it for every wavelength. And after we have this great big wild equation there, we are going to solve it for our... Um, yeah, there is. So we're, we're solving for our reflected light. Okay. So that's how we do an atmospheric correction. Just putting everything in together. You're probably not going to end up using... I actually sometimes will use this formula if I can't find data that has been corrected and I don't want to deal with using radiation transfer programs. I'll just do my own correction. This is leaving out a bunch of stuff, but better than nothing. Okay. So, from here on out, every um, satellite retriever we're going to do, we're going to assume that we've corrected for the effects of the atmosphere, or the end. Because if you don't want to keep seeing that equation over and over again, do you? Now, we're just going to assume we've already done that with any data that we have at the solved problem. So, let's say we want to get that aerosol optical depth. So we have sunlight coming through the atmosphere, it has an aerosol in there. Boom, we're going to correct for the atmosphere and not worry about it anymore. We're only going to worry about the aerosol. But we may have some path radiants in there. So we know that the final intensity is going to be with coming from the sun, draw the atmosphere, aerosol, and then the Rayleigh. Um, scattering as well from the atmosphere in there. Divide by coastline data and then cluster path rates. These things are going to be corrected for. And then you just solve for your aerosol. So you know what this is, you can measure that, and you just add the break, you solve for your aerosol off to the deck. What? 
Um, path radius is what we just talked about. Now this is in a different direction. So, we're going to assume that we just know how to do that based on what we've done before. Okay? And that's how we get aerosol optical depth. That, if you're looking straight through it, the sun to top, that's kind of easy. Unfortunately, you, that's only at one point. If you want to look at the aerosol everywhere, what kind of instrument do we need? You want this guy in the ground? No. We want a satellite. But the poor satellite has a much more complicated situation. Because we're not just looking at sunlight being reflected from the aerosol, we also have to deal with sunlight coming through the aerosol, being reflected from the surface, going back through the aerosol, and then we have to put all the pieces together. Which means we also have to know the reflectance of the surface. Okay, so we know what's going on kind of with this aerosol being reflected um, directly. We know what's happening with the beam of light coming down here. We have to know what the reflectance is, and the reflectance will often change depending on the angle of the sun, the angle of the satellite. So it's something called a bidirectional reflectance function, which maybe you know, maybe you don't. Depending on the surface, people have been busy making catalogs of the reflectance function for the surface, depending on the angle. So you have this guy, and then he has to go up through there, so then it has to be get, you know, Beer's law acting on it again. So then you end up with this big, long, complicated equation, and you get decide for the aerosol optical depth. Okay? So that's why people prefer, if they can't get away with measuring something that's looking straight through the atmosphere, it's a lot easier than a satellite measurement. But there's a trade-off. You don't get to see everything. You can only see that one point where you are. If you want to see everything, you got to suffer for it. And there's a whole bunch of assumptions that are going to be built into here. The data is usually lower quality. Okay? Go on. How about if we wanted to know the cloud optical depth? Well, we usually have. Um, two things that we're dealing with. We have a cloud optical depth, and you also have the size of the particles in there. And it's going to change how much reflection you get. So the way that we do this is we usually have a visible beam of light, and we have a near-infrared beam of light, which is absorbing a little bit in the water. It's kind of key that these two beams of light behave differently. So, let look at one of these. So we have different sizes of the cloud drop particles, going from 4 microns to like 32 micron radius. And then we have different optical depths. So we're going to pick one radius, let's say 8 microns. And as we make the cloud thicker, the reflectance in the visible and in the near infrared both begin to increase. But eventually, the near infrared levels up the near-infrared reaches a limit and can't reflect anymore. Why do you think the near-infrared <coughs> kind of saturates? Remember, it's absorbing. Yeah? Does it reach its cutoff point with like the size difference? Yeah, it, like the wave and it's going to change the size, but for one size, it will kind of reach a oh, saturation. Yeah. Well, let, well, let me reword this. Visible light would saturate a reflecting of one. This saturates a reflecting of 0.4 because it's absorbing light. It's going to look gray in the near infrared. And if we go to a larger particle, now we get to your E to the type thing. Larger particles will absorb more because they're thicker. The larger particles are going to look darker than the smaller particles. So we get, for it, 
every uh, reflectance and for every in the visible in the near infrared we can get optical depth and we can get a size. These have all been calculated in the computer. So this is the computational lookup table. And then you can look at what you see in the visible and reflected and figure out, oh, I, now I know the average cloud drop size. I know the optical depth of the clouds. Okay? So this is a lookup table, actually. And that's how we get what's going on with the clouds. When I had you guys calculate the water content just from reflecting, I had to give you one particle size. But now we can deal with different particle sizes in the class. Okay? One of the most important things we can do with satellite is measure what's happening with vegetation through time. And as I said, we have AVHRR that the satellite goes back to the 70s. We know what's been happening to the rainforest over the last four decades because of satellites. But how do you measure vegetation? Now, you look at first study, we think, oh, this is easy. If it's green, it's vegetation. If it's not green, it's not vegetation. We're going to see that doesn't work so well. But let's look at um, reflecting here in the near infrared. Oh, uh, sorry, reflecting as a function of wavelength. So if we have like snow, the reflectance is a function of wavelength that actually decreases as you get to longer wavelength there. And that has to do kind of with Rayleigh type scatter and stuff like that. Um, soil is kind of funky because again, this is kind of me scattering going on. But look at vegetation. Vegetation, 500 is the green. Get this little tiny hump in the green and then boom. It jumps up in the near infrared. Okay. Nothing as has that big jump. This is actually between the red and the near infrared. That is our best way to detect vegetation. Now, you may think, oh, why can't you just use red and green? With red and green, we have a little tiny change here. Red and near infrared, we've got a big change. So it's a much more sensitive way to detect chlorophyll. So what we're going to do is construct something called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, NDVI. And you take the reflectance in near infrared and the reflectance in red, you find the difference between them. But you know the sun may be low, the sun may be high, so we normalize it by adding them together. Okay? If you're going to be a remote sensing professional, it almost doesn't matter which topic you're looking at. You kind of want to have this formula memorized. Everybody knows that NDVI is. If you don't know what NDVI is, everybody thinks that you don't know remote sensing. So this is one of the key things. It's not perfect in a lot of ways from perfect, but it's something that works very well here. So you can see that at the maximum value of NDVI, red goes to zero, we're going to get NDVI of one. If near infrared goes to zero, we get NDVI of negative one. High NDVI is higher vegetation. Okay. Most things range between like negative 0.5 and about 0.9%. So let's see how this works. So here's our visible RGB image. Ooh, that hasn't been atmospherically corrected. Okay, fixed. So now that atmospherically corrected, you see how the green kind of pops out more? It's important to do this. But here's a problem. We see green here. It's not coming out so well in this board. That actually looks green as well. In fact, that ocean kind of looks kind of green as well too. So if we were just going by green as a way to detect vegetation, we might be fooled. Let's apply the NDVI to this. So this is an NDVI where positive is green, negative is red, and this thing which is looking green in here, that's now red. 
So the NDVI does a better job of picking up vegetation than your own eye does. It's because of the big jump between the red and the near infrared. Okay. So um, if you're wondering how fast the Amazon rainforests are vanishing, use NDVI over the last few decades or so you see it happen. Well, one thing that I should point out is because this is so important, a lot of satellites actually have higher resolution reds than they have in green and blue. Higher resolution is more expensive, but they need it for the vegetation. They can see crops and stuff like that. Okay? So normally the red and the near infrared are the two highest resolution channels on this app. How about we want to see what's going on in the ocean? Well, it turns out that near infrared is pretty well absorbed by water. So this can cause a problem. So we can't use NDVI for the ocean anymore. We have to use things that are oily and visible. Now what they've done here, this is actually kind of reverse, they're looking up fluorescence. So we have one fluorescence kind of in the red here, another one in the blue. I may think, wait a minute, that's backwards. Because you would think, you think vegetation is green, you think you'd see more color coming out in the green, here we're seeing more color coming out in the red and the blue. But this is fluorescence. This is emission, not reflection. So, Vegetation is reflective in the green. It's absorbing in the red and the blue. Okay? A good absorber is a good emitter. Okay? That's why the fluorescence is stronger in the red and the blue. It's absorbing, therefore it's emitting the red and the blue. Okay? And then we look at these and we say, okay, we can use either the blue peak or we can use the red peak here. And we just look at the difference between, like, here is if there's, we're not getting a signal, and like here we're getting a signal, we're looking at the difference between those two things. We could make a kind of NDVI out of that, something like that. Or we could do the ratios between those or stuff like that. But we have to do an atmospheric correction. So looking at an atmospheric correction, Remember, this is the transmission of the atmosphere. Where do we have to do more atmospheric correction? In the blue or in the red? Blue, red. This is transmittance. Oh, well, you, you may be looking at these absorption bands in here. Let's say we're doing like right here a peak where there's no absorption. Where do we have to do more correction for the atmosphere, the red or the blue? The blue, there's more scatter. Okay? So that's why people are typically base everything at the red peak because you don't have to deal with as much radiant scatter. Try to get more correct. Now, we remember we do atmospheric correcting is um, like the surface minus the path ratings divided by the extinction. If you make mistakes in path ratings, you can correct it by subtracting you know, this one from that. We make mistakes in the um, extinction, in the transmitting here. You can make corrections by doing a ratio between these two things. And then, you know, your, your faulty um, emission is going to be canceled out there. Your transmission will be canceled out. Most people, what they do is they take the ratio between these two things, and then they're going to cancel out any mistakes that they make in the in the transmittance. But about, I guess it would be about eight years ago or so, a Crest student, instead of dividing two numbers, he subtracted two numbers. And he got a better result. And what he demonstrated there, though he didn't know it, I had to explain it to him, is the biggest mistake in the atmospheric correction was in the path ratings. So by subtracting two beams, he's actually subtracting out any problems in the path ratings. And he ended up with a better, um, a better retrieval there. Okay. 
Now, if you're doing ocean color, it turns out atmospheric correction is very important. So they always worry about atmospheric correction more than just about any other nutrient. Okay, getting near the home stretch here. Microwave. We remember this formula here. And microwave is long wavelength. What happens to the frequency? All frequencies. So we're going to take the limit as these frequencies become small. Then we can write e to the minus x is 1 minus x. You plug that in. You go through the algebra. And you're going to end up with the um, intensity as a function of frequency and temperature. We'll just go as a constant times the frequency squared times the temperature. So we can just say that intensities and temperatures, brightness temperatures, are proportional to each other. So if you're talking to anybody who does microwave work, they're always talking about brightness temperatures. Because it's just easier to think about the intensities. So what can we do? Let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, most microwave work came out of electrical engineering. They like gigahertz. So they keep talking about, all they talk about are gigahertz. That's not useful to us because we know the size matters. We'd rather do wavelength. So a quick little conversion. Um, one gigahertz is 30 centimeters. So what would 30 gigahertz correspond to in wavelength? One gigahertz is 30 centimeters. Now you go to a higher frequency, 30 gigahertz, one centimeter. Okay. So what you do is you just take the number of gigahertz frequencies, take 30 divided by the number of gigahertz, the number of centimeters wavelength. Okay? Easy, easy to do. So this is microwave atmospheric transmission here. Um, we know this, we have a little bit of absorption in the water vapor at 21 gigahertz. This is a little bit longer than a centimeter wavelength. And then we have our kind of window channels, 87 gigahertz. What wavelength would that be? 30 divided by 80 is about 0.3, about a third of a centimeter. And then 185 gigahertz, that's very strong absorption. Okay. So with that in mind, let's look at something we can do. Let's say you wanted to know where snow has fallen, and maybe even how thick that snow is. And he said, oh, this is easy. Let's look in the satellite, the visible, and wherever there's white, that's where the snow is. What else is white? Clouds. Clouds, OK? And in fact, you may notice normally during a snowfall, there's clouds there. And even after a snowfall, there's often clouds there. I mean, in a place like New York, the snow melts pretty quick. You don't want to wait for the clouds to go away to measure the snow. So what we do is we use microwaves. And again, what is the wavelength of a typical microwave of, let's say, 30 gigahertz? About one centimeter. What's the size of a cloud drop? <coughs> 10 microns. Ready scattering, they go right through the clouds. Okay? So microwaves would go right through that. Now if they're actively forming snow crystals, it's not going to go through there, but then you can detect if the cloud is snowing or not. But once it stops snowing, boom, you can see through the clouds with microwaves. So God, we have this screen here and thing keeps hiding everything. Um, we have the temperature of the ground, we're going to call it T ground. There is a secret. We know that microwaves affect water, right? Water absorbs microwaves, it makes them rotate and stuff like that. Does snow absorb microwaves? No. I'm gonna go back again. Water absorbs microwaves because of rotation. Will snow affect microwaves? No, they're frozen in place, they can't rotate. Snow does not absorb microwaves. Snow and ice do not absorb microwaves. They can scatter microwaves, but they can't absorb microwaves. Okay? Because of the spin. 
Because it can't rotate. Yeah, it can't. It can't do the transitions to the mid back. I'm sure for you that back to life. Okay. So, by the way, if snow can't absorb microwaves, how much emission of microwaves do you think it's going to do? Zero. Zero. This snow basically is not going to be emitting microwaves. It's only going to be scattering microwaves. So, if we have microwaves coming up from the surface, they're coming from the surface below the snow, the snow is not producing any microwaves. So, in the 21 gigahertz, we can say we're going to have T of the ground exponent, T to the minus 20, you know, that's in the 21 centimeters. Okay. Now, um, it turns out that 21 gigahertz, how long a wavelength is that going to be? About 1.5 centimeters. What the size of a snow crystal? Maybe a millimeter or something, right? Much smaller, not much scattered. If we go to, uh, wrong way. If we go to 87 gigahertz, now we're down to about a third of a centimeter, just a few micro, just a few millimeters. This will scatter the snow. Okay? So we're getting snow scattering from this, but not so much from the 21 gigahertz. So you're going to be scattering differently, but kind of like Rayleigh scatters. So if we subtract the two of these, we're going to have T for the ground, 87 minus 21. The um, 87 basically, I mean the 21 basically has no optical depth, it's not scattering. So we're going to have T ground, 1 minus optical depth in 87. So this is really telling you that what we're getting is the brightness temperature of, you know, of the ground times the snow thickness of the optical depth. Okay. So that's how we can measure the thickness of snow, or the optical depth of snow. Okay. I'm scattering different wavelengths to scatter differently of snow. If we're doing soil moisture, things are different. Microwaves do interact with snow. It turns out, um, the 87 is absorbing in water. This is liquid water, it can rotate, stuff like that. So if we have dry soil, we make it the same brightness temperature as at 87 and 185 gigahertz. But if we have wet soil, then we're gonna have different emission. Um, now, I should have, I said this a little bit wrong actually. I, I was talking about absorption. If it's a good absorber, it's a good emitter. Which means that 185 gigahertz, it absorbs very well, it also emits very well. So we're actually going to have more emission 185 gigahertz than we're going to have from 87. So we can go through the same thing, just look at the difference between them. And the difference in emissivity is going to go as the water content. So we're going to see different brightness temperatures depending on how much water content there is. Okay. So that's how you can get soil moisture. We're going to look at correction to that because we have a new satellite, and in this new satellite, they're saying, "Wait a minute, we're dealing with kind of centimeter-long wavelengths and fraction of a centimeter." What's the size of a typical leaf? Several centimeters long. Is a leaf going to scatter wavelengths of just a, few, a fraction of a centimeter? Wait, the, wave, the leaf is bigger than the wave. It does scatter. It does scatter. A lot. Yeah, uh, quite a bit. Or oh, let's geometric, kind of geometrical scatter. How about if I went to 30 centimeter wave? When three, I mean the branches and stuff. But if I went to 30 centimeter wavelength, what's going to happen to the amount of scattering? Decreases. It's going to decrease. It's going to drop. SMAP is using basically one gigahertz, 30 centimeter waves to largely go through vegetation. It's not perfect, 
there is some scattering from vegetation. So they even go further than that. Not only are they gonna, they're gonna decrease the amount of scattering from vegetation, they're gonna try to correct for the decreased amount of scattering from vegetation. So before SMAP, vegetation kind of messed up with the water measurements. So we're gonna use one gigahertz instead of about 100 gigahertz. So we're gonna do about 30 centimeters a day. We're increasing penetration, we're gonna try to correct for it. Let's talk about the correction. Coming from the surface of the earth, we're gonna have the emissivity, which is kind of tied to the water times the brightness temperature. That's how much intensity we have coming through. It's gonna go through the vegetation. We're gonna to have to do a correction for the vegetation. The, the severe slot correction. By the way, remember what this guy is? Single scattering of the That is a fraction of interaction which is scattered. You may think, wait, but don't we have absorption by the leaves? Because the leaves have water and the leaves are going to absorb. Yes. But the leaves absorb and then they re-emit at the same temperature. We're assuming the ground temperature and the leaf temperature is the same. So the leaves will absorb and then re-emit. So you can ignore the absorption. So this corrects for the fact that you don't just, that you, so now it's saying we're only going to be looking at the scattering that's going on. Okay? So that looks like, okay, we've corrected for the vegetation, but this wasn't good enough for the SMAP team. SMAP team goes, wait a minute, we have, by the way, we, we, yeah, we can change this to transmitting to make the equations less messy, so we're just going to replace that with, with transmitting now. Okay. So that's a little bit of a simpler form. But the SMAP team says, wait a minute, the vegetation does more than just scatter the upward, the vegetation is emitting downwards. Okay? So we have our emission of the vegetation at the temperature. Why am I writing one minus transmission if I'm talking about emission? Is there still things below it? It's not on the surface, it's not at the... Because it's quantitative. I, I think Dia, yes. Dia has it. If, if you have 70% is being transmitted, how much is being absorbed? 30%. And then how much is being emitted? 30%. Missing. So, the one minus transmission gives you that emission. You hit the ground, then it's going to be reflected. So again, we're doing um, the amount that's being reflected. If it was being emitted, it would be the emission, but because it's reflected, it's one minus that emission. And then it goes through the vegetation, and we end up with that. Now, um, for some reason, they didn't put single scattering albedo in here. I think they should have. I think maybe the reason they didn't is they corrected it for it once, and they only have to do it once. So I'm a little unsure about that. Maybe they made a mistake. Maybe I'm missing a subtlety in that. If it's the same temperature, you only have to do it once. But you add all of this together, and then what are we looking for? We are actually looking for the emission from the water content in the soil. So you have an algebraic equation. You saw it for that. And then you get the amount of water. Now, one thing you may be wondering is, wait a minute. We have to know what's going on with the vegetation, don't we? How do you think we get the vegetation? NDVI, the one thing you should all know if you're doing remote sensing, okay? So from another satellite to get NDVI and then they can work it through, okay? So notice everything we've been talking about is coming back to haunt you. You don't have to know all of these now because it's too much to know every satellite retrieval algorithm. But we're just trying to point out that everything you've been learning, when you go back and start reading about it, will come back and will help you understand the retrieval. Okay? Last topic here. Let's talk about one thing that satellites are very good for is feature identification. Like, you know, vegetation, but how about if you want to pick out cities? You want to pick out water, and you want to pick out clouds, stuff like that. 
And we have this mountain of data coming from Santa. So it'd be great if we could automatically identify things. Well, let, let's talk about it a little bit. That says building density underneath this thing that I'm screen sharing. So building density and vegetation density. If I take a typical city and I make a plot of vegetation density versus building density, I may see something that looks like this. Notice I'm getting kind of clusters here, right? Well, if you think about it, business industry is going to have high building density, low vegetation. If you go into residential, we begin to get some vegetation density mixing with the building, and then parkland is high vegetation, very low building. So you can do a cluster analysis to pick out different features of the city. Of course, in satellite, we want to do this by wavelengths. But, you know, vegetation we know has some kind of features in, you know, near infrared and, and green, and probably the buildings will have different wavelengths. If you pick your wavelengths right, you can do the classifications. So, there's two kinds of classification here. Something called supervised classification where you say, let me look at all of the parkland and I'm going to figure out what looks like parks. I'm going to figure out what looks like buildings. And I'm going to come up with my classifications. They've got supervised classification because you are in charge. You take a training set and you run it and then you can run it and see if your training works. But mathematically, you can do what's called unsupervised classification where you can pick out the clusters mathematically. We're not going to go into any of the details of that, you know, take advanced statistics or something. But let's look at how this might work. So here is a picture of New York, ignore that square there. I was actually, I'm doing like supervised classification in other places. But here is New York. It's been atmospherically corrected and everything. So if I want to do a supervised classification, I can look at the parkland, I can look at the water, I can look at where there's high building densities, and look at the clouds, and come up with ruins. So I mean, like, here's my first attempt at coming up with ruins, where the gray are the buildings, green vegetation, blue is the water. And you say, eh, hey, you know, I'm missing a lot of water, I'm missing some of the parkland here. So maybe I have to go back and work a little bit harder, and you know, maybe I can do a little bit better, pick up most of the water, but, um, I'm getting funky stuff going on in the Hudson, where part of the Hudson seems to be paved over here. You know, and it takes some work. I keep working at it, and eventually it come up with a good classification. Or, I can just tell the computer, okay, I want water, vegetation, buildings, and clouds. I want four clusters, you go do it. I, it doesn't know what the clusters are gonna be, so these are random colors here. But look at how well, this is obviously the green is the water here. And we have the blues are the buildings. Um, red is the cloud, black is vegetation. So it actually did a pretty good job. Now this is just in green and near infrared. This is actually clustering in four wavelengths, red, blue, green, and near infrared. I'm just showing some of it here. But I have picked out clusters the reason it doesn't, look, the reason it looks arbitrary is because I only have two out of the four. If I had added the other two wavelengths, you begin to see more clear clustering. There are automatic techniques. The drawback of this is after it does the cluster, you have to go and figure out what each cluster actually means. And sometimes it may not be what you think. Okay? But this technique exists. And it has been used not just for this type of thing. Um, International Cloud Climatology Project, it was housed here at Crest for about a decade or so. You can look at cloud optical thickness. They went through and they classified oil clouds by optical thickness and cloud top pressure. You could go do cloud top temperature, but um, if you do something like a CO2 slicing, which is like a split window technique, you can actually get the pressure from how much CO2 is above the cloud. So, so they made a bunch of classifications here, just in terms of depth and depth. And then they said, 
Let's go through and see if different types of weather produce different mixtures of clouds here. So they came up with six different clusters here. One is kind of like fair weather cumulus all the way down to um, what? Okay, this would be like thunderstorm stuff like that, where you're getting thicker optical depth and lower pressures and so on. They picked out different weather states by cluster analysis and said, okay, I can just look at the clouds and automatically cluster them and figure out what's going on, what, what the weather might be underneath these clouds. Okay? So, how is this loading information so you can see how everything fits together? You're not expected to remember any of that except NDVI. Remember NDVI, okay? But anytime you're looking at an algorithm, the first thing you do is not be an idiot, right? <laughs> you have to go and you have to read up on the algorithm. So, this is why you, you Google. You, you type in the, like, what, like, let's say you're doing cloud optical depth or something. ATBD, Algorithm Theoretical Basis Document. For example, if you're looking at the MODIS aerosol, you know, retrieve as you're typing MODIS, aerosol, ATPT, and something would pop up and it's gonna have like 60 pages explaining everything you could possibly know about your satellite algorithm, okay? <laughs> so that's absolutely key. Good. So, um, we are gonna actually do some stuff hands-on here. I think we're gonna give you guys this